is continuing. Luminal does not exist, but it always exists as possibility. Um, how can I kind of tease this out, I guess? Uh, That's a good... I've said before, postmodernists love a good contradiction. The noumenal world doesn't exist, but it always exists as possibility. In other words, it exists infinitely, and it's even more real, maybe, than the real world, because it's all the possibilities of what the real world isn't. And it always exists, even though it doesn't exist. Uh -huh. That's a good... I've said before, postmodernists love a good contradiction. The noumenal world doesn't exist, but it always exists as possibility. In other words, it exists infinitely, and it's even more real, maybe, than the real world, because it's all the possibilities of what the real world isn't. And it always exists, even though it doesn't exist. Postmodernists. You, you say later on in the video that the noumenal is uh, what is experienced without human beings, basically. So it's some mystical thing that we can never get to because it's defined as that which we can never get to. That isn't what it is. He, he contradicts that right there. He says... That isn't what it is. The noumenal world is not just the world we can't get to. It's not just the world beyond our senses, beyond what humans can access. Okay? It's not that. It is. What is it, Sario? Clarify for us. It's the possibility that things are not as they are when they give themselves to us. As All those arbitrary possibilities you can come up with. That's the noumenal world. Kant said the noumenal world makes itself known to you by a feeling of duty. Now, you judge for yourself if Kant and Zorio are talking about the same noumenal world. Human beings. Um, and you're going to talk about the categories here soon. I know, I know you are. I remember that. Um, but, for now, let's just say, let's define the noumenon as the possibility that things are different or at least some, somehow different, I guess. Another exacting, hair-splitting definition from Zario. The possibility that things are somehow different than what they seem to be when they give themselves Than how we perceive them. Than how we perceive That's them. That's always a possibility. That's always a possibility, he says, that things are different than how we perceive them. And I don't know how you measure that possibility, unless you got it from perceiving things, and then a minute later you're like, oh, I perceived that all wrong. It was a car. I thought it was a banana. <laughs> there's, there's no rational proof that things are exactly as we experience them. There's no rational proof that things are exactly as we experience them. This is a point, again, Zorio, that the objectivist could clarify for you, that we start axiomatically from the fact that existence exists, that we exist ourselves, and that there is a reality that has a nature that we can investigate. So, our five senses just give us access to that. Now, you exclude it all from the very beginning by saying our senses don't show us reality, all that other shit. But the objectivists say that our five senses give us hardcore, real-time information directly from the universe. And the universe is a real thing that we can all get together in and see each other. We're not locked apart in separate little universes or subjective worlds. We're together in the universe, and the universe is real and objective. And our five senses give us streams of actual real data from that real universe that we live in day to day. We can know things about that universe. We can understand that universe. Skeptics to you, to the contrary, notwithstanding. I heard of that, because you just touched on that, that there's a feeling. Now, the categorical imperative is essentially that uh, when you act, you should, uh, through reason... Now, he explains the categorical imperative a little more. Now, Kant, he, the reason that Kant had to use a feeling, ultimately, at the end of the day, was as follows. He said the categorical imperative is, is categorically everyone should act, um, this particular way. So, uh, it's an imperative that, uh, ca it's categorical action, an imperative for all humans, and that that's how you should evaluate your actions. Whether or not you should do any given thing depends on whether or not everyone would be able to do it or should do it. So he gives the example, what if somebody, uh, robs a store or rapes? 
And so is it possible for us to say everyone should rob the store or rape when they want to? No, that would be complete chaos. Therefore, that would be excluded as a moral possibility. It has to be something that everybody would be able to do. It has to be something you can apply universally. The categorical imperative says any action you take has to be able to be taken by everybody all the time justly. Essentially, imagine what would happen if everyone acted that way. That is, you make your action a universal action. You maximize it. So, he gives two examples. Helping a friend, on the one hand, or um, being a, a robber, on the other hand. Could everyone commit robbery? Could everyone help a friend? How would the world be if everyone committed robbery? It'd be chaos. What if everyone helped a friend? Oh, there'd be flowers everywhere. So then I'm going to ask the question, why couldn't we all commit robbery? Why couldn't we? Why? And you say it'd be total chaos. And I say, so? And you say, well, chaos is bad. And I, and I say, why? And then we're at the end of the station again. We've got to figure out where morality comes from. Kant doesn't give an answer. That's why he has to get to his feeling of duty somewhere. At some point he has to say that the categorical comparative makes itself known through a feeling of duty. It can't be rationally justified. Uh, you know, that's, uh, Ayn Rand said, all philosophers get to a point where you have to accept, accept something they say on their say-so. All philosophers get there. All the crazy gyrations and logical deductions from sets of information and all the stuff they do is always within a system where you have to just accept something. Like with Hume. He says, you don't know if the sun's going to come up tomorrow. You just have faith in it. You don't know if you're going to fall through the floor the next minute. You just have faith. That's bullcrap. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. You just have to accept it and go forward from there with with that and ex and just take it without any question. You just have to take it on faith. And that's how you have to take Kant's feeling of duty. Because at the end of the day, he doesn't offer any justification for morality whatsoever. He just says at the end of the day, well, you have to feel it. You feel it. Because you can't justify why there should or shouldn't be chaos or whatever. At the end of the day, it's a feeling. So, the thing is, though, the categorical comparative is not completely rational, because it is beyond reason. This is Great. Categorical imperative is not completely rational, because it is beyond reason. This is the place where reason cannot go, the it's same thing that we were talking about with faith. It is the place where reason cannot go. Now, remember before, I just reject out of hand his explanation of why we have to have faith. You don't have to have faith. I reject it out of hand completely. Uh, it can be explained. There's no reason to go assuming and telling people that they have to have faith to walk around every day. They don't. It's ridiculous and bizarre. The thing that we were talking about with faith, that it is entirely possible to imagine things happening in different ways than what they are, how they actually happen. Now, that's a little hint at something. I'm afraid we're going to have to take a minute on it here, called the analytic-synthetic dichotomy. The dichotomy between the analysis of a thing and the synthesis uh, of a thing. The synthetic nature of the thing, the man-madeness of it. Um, and, and an example is this. Uh, if I say that uh, man is an animal that has two eyes, that's analytically true. You can just analyze the definition of man. It's, uh, uh, two arms, two legs, and a rational faculty, you know? So that's, that's fine. That would work just fine. And what if I said uh, that ice floats on water? Is that included in the definition of ice? And uh, their argument is that there are things like that that you have to go to reality to investigate. You can't just get it from the concept itself. Um, we could imagine, as Zorio would say, you could imagine things being another way. Well, yes, if we made the drawings for the cartoons down at uh, the Disney Studios, we could imagine teapots floating about and stuff. 